everybody. Uh, I'm Rob. I'm Captain of Ocean Rescue. Uh, not uh, Captain of the Life of the Life Saving Corps, like the Peaches Leader just printed accidentally, uh, but we'll forgive him. Uh, how many Corps members, former Corps members, do I have here? Crabtrees. What's your name, sir? John Burnsler. John? Uh, and then you have George uh, and the Crabtrees and John Caraway. Uh, and then I got Eli Phillips, uh, my lieutenant of Ocean Rescue right there. He's a retired member. Uh, still very active. Uh, he's like our right-hand man uh, on beach patrol. Uh, so for you to, to, that don't know, uh, we've been lifeguarding here for like 107 years now. It's 100 and, uh, since 1912, uh, and we that we've, had, we've uh, volunteered every Sunday and holiday, uh, and plus a lot of additional time uh, every year since then. Uh, and every year, I think it improves uh, the training that we that we get. Uh, and quality of people that we get, uh, like Ben Hestrom, he's a retired <laughs> Anyone you can, right? Uh, but we've, uh, we've got a long history uh, of service to the community uh, and a long history of mentoring uh, and teaching young men and women now uh, since then. Uh, and one of the things we do, of course, is lifeguarding, but really I, I kind of consider that that's only one part of what we do. It's probably the, the main thing, but one of the things we really do is we take guys and girls that were 16, 17, and this is probably their first job, uh, a lot of them, uh, and we teach and mentor them, not just in lifeguarding, uh, but in all kinds of life skills. Uh, I learned a lot of things here, even though I got here after having been in the Navy and been a Navy rescue swimmer and been around the world, but I really gained a lot of confidence in life from here. I gained a lot of skills in how to deal with people, how to deal with tough situations, uh, and difficult people, or even great people. But just uh, an overall uh, an overall addition to my life, and I think everybody's life here, I think these guys can attest. Is this the most important, one of the most important things you guys ever did in your life? Yeah. Most influential. Most influential. Uh, but I can say for just about everybody that, that that this is a life-changing experience, uh, and it taught them the value of service to the community. Uh, and a lot of these guys go on and do things like become firefighters, nurses, doctors, or all kinds of other um, other careers that really serve other people. Uh, not everybody, but I think a large part of them. We probably got at least 30 firefighters between St. John's County and Jacksonville. Uh, none in Jacksonville Beach, uh, but. We've got a whole diverse group of people, young and old. And one of the really cool things is guys like these guys come back around and they continue to give. Like George, he's been, uh, he probably spends more hours uh, devoted to the Corps than probably any, even active member. Uh, and he loves it more than any, don't you, George? <laughs> Man, a few words. But I can tell you for sure that, that nobody loves this place. Much George, he spends a lot of his time, and I know even John Caraway there, he comes down to see how we're doing, uh, and I see him checking in on us to make sure that we're still doing right, uh, and hopefully we're still making these guys proud uh, in the way we do things now. Uh, the Life Saving Corps uh, has evolved, has had to evolve. Uh, we got the first ladies in the Corps only in 1995, so if you figure from going from 1912 all the way to 1995 and having no ladies uh, be lifeguards, uh, that's probably quite a feat in itself. But uh, it's certainly the wrong thing. And we all had to adjust and adapt. I got in in 1994, uh, and uh, it wasn't a big deal to me to find that we were kind of finally going to get female guards. Uh, but some of the old timers uh, that were here uh, probably didn't, uh, didn't uh, like that idea as much. Uh, but now we've got a, a large percentage of them that, that, uh, that are late, uh, female lifeguards, and they're, they're amazing. They have a great work ethic. Uh, they're just as tough as the boys. Uh, they may not be necessarily physically strong, but uh, they can outwork them. Uh, and they, they're, we're really, uh, really glad to have them. And now it's seamless. It's, a, it, it's like it was never, never a thing. But for years, uh, it was kind of a men's club. One of the things I'm really proud of uh, that we do now is the guys really, uh, they behave uh, really well, they're very professional, and the training uh, that we get uh, is second to none. We have traveled uh, 
uh, and lifeguarded in a lot, of, a lot of other places. Some of our guys have been lifeguards in Ponte Vedra. Some of our guys have been to California. And, and with the competition team uh, that races and competes against other lifeguards on the East Coast and uh, in other areas of the country, and even in Australia, uh, we've seen uh, the way other lifeguards lifeguard and the way they train. Uh, and I'm really proud to say that we've got some of the best training and some of the best lifeguards uh, of anywhere. Uh, and when we go to those places, uh, one of the things that we do now is we try and learn what they do there to improve our game here, to improve our skills, to improve our service uh, to the community, and just basically do the best job we can do lifeguarding. That's really what it's all about, and that's really how it started. In 1912, there were no lifeguards here. And uh, a nurse named Mary Proctor uh, was out at the beach, and she wasn't a good swimmer, and she drowned. Uh, and uh, I guess the doctor, uh, from what I understand, the doctor that she worked for uh, didn't like that too much, naturally. Uh, and he and then some of the other community members uh, set out to form a life-saving corps uh, that would prevent anybody else from drowning. And that's been our goal ever since then. Is to not let anybody no, no drownings in Jacksonville Beach or back then Pablo Beach, uh, and so every Sunday and every holiday since then, uh, there's been well-trained lifeguards out here, uh, giving their time and sweat uh, and going out there risking themselves uh, to rescue people from the ocean, and that's really that's really the, our our main goal, our, our our whole entire premise of what we do is is uh, life-saving uh, and volunteering to do that. Just by the fact that we all volunteer, it assures, without a doubt, that the people that are doing it are dedicated to it. Uh, I'm sure Ben can tell you, you know, how dedicated we all are, but if, uh, if everybody was paid, it, it kind of could leave the opportunity open for guys just doing it somewhat for a job. Everybody needs a job, everybody wants to make money. Uh, so we do get paid Monday through Saturday, uh, but the fact that we all started out and got our training with the Life Saving Corps, and we continue to give our time, uh, and even these guys, uh, it, it assures a high quality of people, a high quality of lifeguard that, that really wants to do it, uh, not to meet girls, not to make some money, or not to be cool, uh, but really just because they that's what they want to do. They want to be a part of this, this tradition, uh, a storied organization that's part of the community, and really that's, that's greater than themselves. Because I, I, can't do, I can't do what we do here alone if I just had a paid group. Uh, I see the way other lifeguard agencies work, and they do a great job, uh, but we're able to do better because of guys like these uh, th that really, really love doing it, and they probably wouldn't want to do it anywhere else. Uh, I've been other places, uh, and been offered, I've been offered a job in Fort Lauderdale, uh, by the lieutenant down there, and he said, well, I'll hire you right now. Uh, just come and do our test, and you can be lifeguard tomorrow. And I said, well, you know, Jim, thanks a lot, but, you know, I like I like doing it in Jacksonville Beach. I like being a part of the Life Saving Corps, uh, and I like lifeguarding here. Even though there's not as much opportunity uh, down there, they're full-time, and they can retire uh, here. I only have one full-time lieutenant, uh, myself, and one other guy gets uh, insurance and benefits. But all the rest of us, uh, all the other guys, we have to give them things that keep them here. Uh, our, our basic, uh, our basic uh, term of service, essentially, is the year. But after you do eight years, uh, we have this uh, tradition of uh, after your eighth year of service, you can retire. And uh, are you guys all retired? Those guys all retired. They, they put in their eight years, Ben, myself, Eli, who was here. Uh, there's a very short list of uh, retired core members. Uh, they don't get any money. Uh, they don't really get uh, any benefits that you would associate with uh, retirement. Uh, but one of the things they do get is a lifetime vested membership or an honor that they spent eight years out here, at least 150 hours, but more like probably 300 hours a year volunteering. Uh, a lot of these guys probably have thousands of volunteer hours uh, directly to the Life Saving Corps. George probably has uh, 10,000 or who knows. <laughs> uh, but but that, that's really an amazing, unique thing that uh, doesn't exist anywhere else in the whole country. Uh, when we started, 
we later, uh, soon after we formed, uh, we formed other organizations in other cities like St. Augustine, uh, Miami, uh, up in Savannah, I believe, Charleston. Uh, there was a number of, even Havana, Cuba, we formed volunteer life-saving corps, just like what we were doing here, to keep people from drowning there. Uh, and we're the only surviving one. We're uh, the only one that's, that's been able to hold on doing this thing that we like. I don't know whether it has to do with just this station. Uh, the station itself is a historical building. Uh, and just the station being that little grounding rod, uh, a social hub, and a place where the guys meet. Uh, I know more so in our time when uh, Ben was starting, when I was starting before cell phones, uh, we would come here and meet. It was a clubhouse. And it was kind of like our second home, but for some of us, it was our primary home. Uh, one, of the, one of the things about here is uh, the upstairs is a dorm, and any active member can stay uh, one night or all they want, uh, provided they, they keep giving back, keep volunteering, they pay their dues, uh, and stay qualified to be lifeguards. But once you retire, uh, this, this can be your home uh, for life, basically. Uh, and that's a, that's a huge honor. I know I've been down here, spending, living here uh, uh, before I uh, got married, and I see John Carraway come down on what, Saturday nights, I think. Uh, pretty regularly on a Saturday night, John would come down, and we would all, all these guys from different generations. Uh, it's a very unique thing to find guys, you know, Ben's age, and my age, and John's age, and all the care, all the craft trees here. We come back here and still give back, give energy, or even if it's just sitting down and telling stories, or hearing stories, like John come down and want to know what's going on, guys, right? And I would like to make a correction. <coughs> I didn't come down to check on you guys. I come down because I wanted to be 16 again. <laughs> <laughs> How'd it work? It's working good. It's working good. <laughs> and I, there's a lot of truth in that. There's a lot of fact in what John is saying. Uh, I can guarantee you I wouldn't be near as healthy as I am if it wasn't for this place. Uh, I'm very inspired by it. I'm inspired uh, by all the younger members, uh, the things that they accomplish. Uh, right now, I have a medical director, uh, Dr. Andrew Schmidt. For the first time ever, uh, about two years ago, we got an actual medical director working for us, for the city, at least on the beach control side, uh, and also advising the Life City Corps on medical protocols uh, and basically backing us up. If a lawyer ever comes and says, well, you didn't rescue us fast enough, or I, you know, my so-and-so didn't make it because you guys didn't do this. But we actually have an expert who's an excellent lifeguard and an expert in pathology of drowning uh, that he, he came back uh, and, and now is giving back like that. He's donating his services as a medical director at no cost to us. We have a contract, and having him backing us up, saying yes, this is exactly what you guys should be doing. The things you do, the training that you have is the best, uh, and you're doing the right thing so that uh, it's pretty hard to second guess what our guys do. Uh, as long as they act to their training uh, and we train them thoroughly, uh, you know, there's nothing else we can expect of them. So, uh, that's one of the really, really special things on this place is it, it inspires people to keep giving back. Uh, there's the press captain right there, right? But we've got a really unique and special place here, uh, and it just it keeps going on for this amount of time just because of the, the love that all these members have for it. Uh, I think anywhere else it would have changed just like all the other cities that had Life Saving Corps. Uh, it's just uh, a combination of a really uh, amazing group of people putting their energy into it, uh, sometimes at, at cost uh, to their own uh, success, because you know, you're, you're not going to get rich being a lifeguard, uh, you're not going to, you know, you're not going to get a lot of things if, uh, if you spend, uh, spend more years here doing this, but it's something that's really, really worthwhile, and not just uh, with the lives you save, uh, not just with pulling people out of the water and having that appreciation that that person's alive because of what we did, our training. Uh, it's not just because of that, just it's so worth it because of the lifelong friendships that we all have made and the uh, impact that the Corps had in the community, uh, even outside life-saving. Uh, the guys really do a lot more 
Uh, they do a lot of, a lot of things uh, for the community and for each other. It's just a huge value. Just the mentoring alone, uh, it's a worthwhile program. Even if we didn't even lifeguard, we didn't even get onto the sand, if we still still did all the things we do to teach uh, young young uh, men and women how to how to act and how to how to live life right. You know, you just that's one of the real values to it. That it's kind of intangible. Uh, it's been a great value to me. I wouldn't be uh, the person I am if it wouldn't have been for coming here. And I just I can't. Uh, possibly give back enough to, to repay the core for what it did me. And I can't thank all these guys uh, for being an influence on me. Uh, even though I learned a lot of things in the Navy and I had the good, good influences in my life, this place as a whole uh, was completely life-changing, just, like, uh, just like they said. It's literally life-changing and, and, uh, and that's really the, the, the real value in it. Chris? I just wanted to say really quick, when he was talking about the medical director, Andrew Schmidt, that is actually Jack Schmidt, our board president's son, which I think is a really neat connection, so next time you see Jack. Um, and then, can you speak about the buoy over your head there and the significance of it? Yeah, this buoy is actually a replica. I've got a real one up in my office I can bring down. Uh, it belongs to past Captain Tom Wright. Uh, but this buoy uh, was invented here, uh, improved and perfected by Henry Walters. Uh, Henry Walters uh, wasn't an actual lifeguard here, but he was a friend of the Corps and uh, essentially an honorary member. And he invented this buoy uh, that improved life saving. Uh, in the early years, all we had were life rings like you'd see on a ship. Uh, you could throw it to somebody or you could swim out with that. It really wasn't the best thing to get through the water with. Uh, and Henry uh, invented this buoy. It's chambered. Uh, the cone and the cylinder. They're all separate, so there's three separate chambers in there. But you might think, well, a, a metal can might not be the best thing to take out in the water because it leaks. Now you've got a metal anchor. Uh, but having three chambers uh, made it a lot uh, more likely for it to not sink. Uh, I'm Jim Crabtree, uh, summer 57. We lived on 11th Street in Springfield. And down the corner, on the corner of uh, 11th Street, on Pearl, Henry Waters lived, and in his garage, he manufactured that buoy there. Oh. I watched him many, many days in his garage making that buoy. Oh, wow. yeah. What kind of tools did he use? I mean, did he, he have big machines or hand no, tools? No, he didn't have any machines. It's all they're really handmade. He would hammer this and hammer that and put it together. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to go get the real one before we get all finished uh, and let you see the real one. Yeah. Because uh, the cool thing about it is the seams, this is a replica and it doesn't come close. Uh, we paid some people, we've uh, looked and tried to find some people to replicate them, but so far nobody's been able to do it. Uh, maybe the sheet metal craft is kind of like many craftsman skills has kind of died out. Uh, but we wanted to have some replicas and maybe even some functional ones. Uh, but this is as close as we could get. And they're kind of a novelty gift that we, we've given to some guys. But there are some real ones still around. I, I've got one that I'm uh, working on restoring. And hopefully I'll be able to swim the marathon with it. We have a swim every year in July. It's three and a half miles. Uh, and a lot of the older guys uh, like me <coughs> like to swim with a real Walters buoy instead of the Burnside plastic buoys. Uh, they're definitely lower maintenance. Uh, I'm sure these guys can tell you how many times they've scraped and yeah. chiseled and wire brushed and painted those things, right? That's right. Yeah. Uh, every spring, uh, spring training yeah. was probably a misnomer. It's really spring cleaning and spring painting, right? Yeah. <laughs> so that's one of the things the guys always did was uh, fix up the station and do work painting and whatever fixing needs done, they would do that all spring long uh, before the main season of summer. Uh, but there were many, many of these. I remember hanging in the boat room racks with so many Walters buoys, even when I got in in 94, uh, we would still use them next to the old pier on the south end. Uh, the idea being, uh, this nice pointy end was pretty good to wedge between somebody that was holding on for their life to the wooden pilings, and they wouldn't want, never want to let go because they think they're going to drown. And if you show up, hey, I'm a Jack Beach lifeguard, uh, grab my buoy, and, and of course they don't want to, so you might have to pry them off there. <laughs> <laughs> That's a pretty effective tool. Uh, luckily, uh, every time I went on a beer case, I was able to uh, convince them with a few choice words. 
and uh, inspire some confidence with a big loud voice. Uh, but that's that's one of the other things that the core teaches you is confidence and uh, and assertiveness. George, where are you? Going? I recently ran across a document in the archives that uh, explained that Henry Walters had a, uh, a, a man of color that did a lot of his work, or did all of them actually, mm -hmm. and he was paying him close to 18 to 20 dollars to make a buoy and selling them to the core for 10 dollars or giving them. Wow. So this was back when Henry was active, and that is prior to 1950, so that'll give you some idea of now the Burnside buoy is costing us in the neighborhood of $60 per buoy. Yep. So all of these steel buoys were handmade uh, either by Mr. Walters or by a fellow that he had occasionally worked for him, and I just thought you'd like that. And Henry uh, applied for and got a patent uh, for the buoy. We've got up in the station upstairs, we've got a, a copy that, of course, George made and put up uh, a nice picture of Henry's patent application describing how it could be used. And it, it was a little more elaborate, it had extra rope and other things that you could put around somebody. Uh, but Henry actually, I guess, sold them to other lifeguard agencies. They were so good uh, that they were used in St. Augustine, Daytona, I don't even know where all. And, and maybe George, maybe you have an idea, but they were definitely used on both coasts because I've seen pictures of Walter's buoy uh, in California. I don't, I don't know, I couldn't find anything else out about it. But that's one of the cool things about us is we're we're all kind of history dorks uh, because we, for the whole time here, I've been here uh, a long time, 20, 23 years, and I'm still digging and trying to find out history and correct things, uh, stories that I've been told that were lies or exaggerations. Uh, either that or exaggerating and uh, making my own uh, lies and stories be better. Tell but, us a little bit about the Burnside buoy, how it came about and so forth. Well, uh, there was a guy, I believe, in California, uh, Bob Burnside, I think, uh, and uh, he set out to try, and, uh, much like Henry, to try and invent a, a better a better tool. Uh, and it's a roto-molded, one-piece plastic buoy. Uh, and when they first brought him down here, from what I was told, some of the guys were like, you can't rescue somebody with some plastic toy, we're not going to need that, we don't want that here, so they, they resisted and he said, well how about this? He threw it down on the ground and uh, told them to drive a truck over it, uh, and it didn't really hurt, it kind of squished it and it popped right back. Uh, but uh, we finally started getting some, I don't know who was uh, brave enough to make that decision, I wouldn't, wouldn't, wouldn't have wanted to be the guy. Uh, that decided to start buying plastic buoys. But we got some down here and started using it and found out that you don't have to pay them every year. Uh, <laughs> Easy maintenance. That's probably the thing that probably sold it more than being lighter or, or maybe they won't dent or ding and it won't hurt you and, and uh, it won't ever get full of water. About what uh, year hmm? the Burnside buoy get in there? Well, we started getting in the early 90s. Uh, I've heard a couple different things and maybe George knows the exact year. Early 90s, uh, because they were mostly in use when I got here in 94. 94. So literally the year I got here, I know I sat at the beach with a plastic buoy and a metal buoy uh, on one side or the other of my tower. Of course, the metal buoy was towards the pier uh, in case uh, you got there and you had to fry somebody off. And I went on a rescue and I accidentally brought the plastic one. And I rescued the guy just fine, uh, but I got in a lot of, a lot of grief about uh, bringing the wrong buoy with me, and then, uh, yeah. hopefully, uh, hopefully I didn't set the trend for getting rid of the, the, the Walters buoy after that, but there were so many of them around here for a while, when they started pulling them off the beach, uh, I think they were up on peg for a while, uh, they were in corners, uh, and everybody stopped kind of really caring about them, so they kind of started getting given away. George? I, I don't like to interrupt you, but I, I want you to interrupt The, the steel buoys, uh, Henry Walters died, that he had that he employed to make them when he was available, uh, he passed away. <clears throat> so the, the core went to several people trying to get some buoys made. They ended up with the, uh, I forget what they called it, but the school board had an industrial school for kids that didn't like to go to school, but they were <laughs> industrial types. 
they made them out there. They made 20 of them, and they came in, and we apparently used them for a few weeks, and they leaked. So they went back, and they didn't get fixed, and then they tried some more, and they leaked. So we were having problems with, we got new buoys, but they didn't float. <laughs> they filled up with water. So that's about when the Burnside buoy uh, came into being. It was an alternate to leaking buoys. Yeah. And that's the best I can put that part of the story together. We, we definitely had them still here uh, when I started, and then they got transitioned out of use. Uh, and then nobody really thought, well, in a, in a few years, these, go, these things are going to be really valuable, uh, and we should keep them. Uh, so now, uh, you'd be hard pressed to find one. Uh, the one in the office, I'm, I'm real glad nobody's decided to steal it. Uh, it doesn't belong to us, it belongs to uh, Pass Captain Tom Wright. Uh, but he's been gracious enough to leave it here so we can still show people. Uh, but I think George, even in archives, he didn't have any Walters buoys in archives until uh, I think one year I got uh, my hands on a few. Uh, and I gave George two, uh, and I kept the best one for me. Uh, and it still doesn't float. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, so there's a lot of really cool history, uh, but I think the really coolest part uh, is the part that we're building now. Uh, we've had to evolve, uh, George and Johnny and the guys, even Ben to tell you, all the changes uh, that we've had to go through and realize that we have to progress. Because being around for so long uh, kind of makes you uh, uh, get stuck in, in history or get stuck in the past. And, we had to realize we have to move on and, uh, and improve and you know, get things like jet skis or, or train guys. Uh, I remember when I got in, we trained in basic Red Cross first aid, uh, and we are like, well, that's, all, that's all we need. CPR, first aid, uh, and it, it got suggested that we, would, we should learn uh, more advanced first aid, first responder. Uh, and it's about, I think then it was like a 50 hour course, and now it's about a 56 hour course, uh, emergency responder, uh, and it's about the first third or so of EMT, uh, and now all our guards, uh, as a minimum, get get first responder, uh, but when, when it was suggested that we take that, uh, it was just another thing that they were like, why do you need that? You know, why do you need a plastic buoy, and why do you need advanced first aid training? We do fine with the way we've been doing it, uh, but luckily, everybody realized that we got to continuously improve, we got to continuously improve our training and look at what we do and say, how can we improve our skills and our service to the community in programs that we do uh, and everything that we do, our behavior. Uh, we don't do a lot of things that we used to do, and uh, a lot of guys say, well, we, you know, it's too bad we don't do this anymore or that anymore. Uh, but, but we realized we had to get rid of anything that looked like hazing, anything, uh, any of the traditions that made us look like uh, you know, young guys just having fun and we needed to be more like professionals. Uh, and that's really what we are now. That's what all my guys, I'm really proud of everything they do. I've got at least 25 EMTs uh, out of my 80, I've got 84 out of the probably 100 core members that are active, uh, and about a quarter of them are EMT or better. I've got paramedics, uh, a couple doctors, I've got several people with master's degrees in nursing. Uh, so all those higher skills uh, come right back and get to train, and we train in here uh, in spring training. We train upstairs. We have, we have uh, classes all spring long. 100% uh, of the guys get recertified, uh, and the Corps does all that uh, for us. So when I, as beef patrol captain, I know the quality of lifeguards I'm getting. I know exactly when I hire those guys. I don't even have to think about it. All I have to find out is did they complete their spring training? Yes. Then I know I'm getting an excellent lifeguard, uh, and I tell the city that without doubt. All these guys that I hire can do the job without question. And then throughout the year, all, all, all summer long, we continue to build on that. We do practical skills testing. Every morning, every day, we get a training hour. It might be running and swimming, or it might be scenarios uh, where somebody's having a, a medical issue or somebody's drowning. Uh, we do drills uh, regularly and frequently to keep the guys really honed or sharp edge. Uh, and we're just continually trying to improve that and to build and to make all these past captains right here. You see every captain that's been captain of the Life Saving Corps on that back wall. Uh, and to make them proud and to make these guys 
confident that we're doing a good job of carrying on the tradition of the Corps uh, of training the best lifeguards and, and, uh, and, and giving the best service to our community. What kind of physical standards do they have to meet? Well, endurance and all. The very, very basic stuff, and it's a minimum. I can tell you, it's just a minimum, minimum. Uh, a 500 meter swim in under 10 minutes uh, in a pool, and then a mile run. Uh, right now, a mile run in under eight minutes. Uh, years ago, it used to be a pier run. I think when you guys did it, it was a pier run, so it was about six blocks. Yeah. And what do we have? Two minutes or something like that. It was, it was a pretty basic run, uh, uh -huh. but now we increased it to a mile. Uh, and basically, we joined the USLA about 10, 15 years ago, George? <coughs> well, we, uh, we went to the USLA, which is uh, the U.S. Life Saving Association. It's an accrediting agency for uh, ocean lifeguards. Uh, and again, we met resistance. We're like, why do we need to have an agency to tell us what we're doing? To, and we're like, look, we, they're not going to tell us what we're doing. They're going to look at our training and say, this training is is on par with any lifeguards in the United States or anywhere, and that's what we did. We went to the USLA standards and moved our swim up a little bit from a quarter mile swim to a 500 meter, uh, and no, nobody died, and everybody passed the swim, and it, it worked out. <laughs> How many documented saves does the Corps have in Gosh, the you know, uh, in, a, in a hundred thousands? some years? It's definitely thousands. Thousands. Uh, thousands, thousands. Uh, I don't know if I... Yeah, George, I keep on there. Really? George, no, nobody knows. <laughs> really, what the real number, uh, the real number that's not even possible to give is if we have all these documented rescues, the real number is how many did we prevent? Oh, uh, we have that. We're more preventive than you'll hear the guys whistling if you're ever on the beach. Right. Uh, the guards are taught to be very proactive. Yes. Uh, and they're taught to recognize the situation even before you realize that you're struggling. Right. Uh, they can recognize a lost child before the kid knows he's lost. Uh, they can recognize a rip current, and, and that's what they do. They get out there and they see the rips. They're up on the tower, and they'll get down and talk to that person or whistle at them and get out there and say, hey, you don't want to swim there. You need to swim over here. Uh, and we've been to other beaches, and they're great lifeguards, but I think we're more proactive and recognize situations and, and prevent accidents because we really, yes. if we do our job right, we don't have rescues. Uh, my whole whole eight years when I was active before I retired, I only had two rescues uh, on core days. Uh, one of them, uh, the guard before me left me a little mess, and I knew I would have to uh, go before I got off the truck, uh, and the truck didn't get very far before I flag dropped and went and got him, but, uh, and another was a kid that was so close, I was trying to get his mom's attention, uh, but I didn't get any rescues, and I was a little disappointed. But really, uh, I was doing my job the way I was trained to. Uh, and all these guys will tell you, like, you know, if you have a whole lot of rescues, people are going to think, well, what are you doing wrong? <laughs> you shouldn't, you shouldn't be getting this many rescues. Like, if you're here a lot, you're going to get rescues. And a lot of the times, most of the rescues I really was taking part in were responding with the truck and going to rescues either where there wasn't a guard uh, or to back up the guard that was there. So really, the number would be a lot, lot higher. And we, we have no doubt, uh, any of you guys that have traveled to other beaches, and Ben, I know you've been with me in places like Cape May, New Jersey, and they have great guards, but we were shocked to see the things that they would let people do. They would uh, let people swim in places that, you know, we were going up to the and saying, hey, do you want us to uh, take care of that for you? Do you want us to get those people away from those rocks or, yeah. you know, that rip current? So we. We're really, uh, really proud of the prevention and all the numbers that we don't have. Well, you warn about uh, jellyfish and shark, and you treat those injuries. We do. Don't you? Uh, we see maybe two or three shark bites a year, uh, and we stay in contact with uh, Dr. George Burgess, who maintains the the World Shark Bite Database, and and we've learned a lot from him, uh, and kind of confirm what we already know is really sharks really don't like to eat us. Uh, luckily, they like fish, and as long as we don't smell like or look like fish, or you're out there in the dark and they maybe think you're a fish, then you know you shouldn't be out there in the dark. Or, and the main advice we give people is if, if there's a school of fish and something's eating them, move out of the way. Uh, right, and we have treated some. We've responded to uh, after hours, seems like in the evening. Uh, and in outlying areas, the beach, like in the 37th South area, we've, mm -hmm. we've come and treated some. 
Uh, only one since I've been here was major. Uh, and it was uh, most likely a bull shark, but it was really uh, the lady still. Uh, we see her around. She rides a bike and has a cool scar. Uh, she gets to say that she uh, survived a bull shark attack, but she still goes in the water. But really, the sharks really uh, aren't a major thing. I've, I've never heard of, in my whole time here, never heard of anybody losing a body part. Uh, so I'd say that's not even an issue. Uh, you had a, I else had a question too. Yes, ma'am. I just wondered, with all of the training and everything that you do, do you ever just say to somebody that they're not qualified? We do, a lot. Uh, there is a very high attrition rate, uh, and probably 75%, maybe 60 to 75%. And what was it when you guys were in? How many guys would drop out? Not very many. Really? No. Well, we would uh, we get guys show up uh, in the first week. Uh, we realize, and we'll usually have to inform them, you're not going to be you're not going to be able to do this. You know, if you're swimming and it takes this long, uh, a lot of guys will show up and, and be strong swimmers. We let them know like it's a rigorous, physical, strenuous training class. It's 12 weeks long, uh, and it's 10 hours a day, and we're going to make you tired. We're going to make you uh, sore, and we're going to try and get you scared. We're going to test your mental toughness, your physical toughness, and your personality to see if you can stay cool in a, in a tough situation. It, it'd uh, help if you had a buddy on the clock when you're doing your swim. Right. <laughs> well, that's, that's one of the things we, we for sure, uh, I can personally tell you, we time it several different times. So even if we made a mistake uh, the first time, uh, nobody's going to sneak by. And then our daily training, we run and swim every morning. Uh, and really, now that assures that, yeah, if you did your training initially or you did your spring training, now you have to stay in shape all year long because we go out in the water every morning. Uh, and if you're lagging behind, uh, we're going to see it. If we go out and we swim the buoys out there, we run down to the pier, swim back, and do a bunch of other exercises, uh, if you're not in shape, we're going to know right away. Because uh, you're not going to be feeling good. You're going to be marking the back, uh, and we're going to be talking to you. And we have a provision in our bylaws, uh, a special examination. If, we, if anybody, any member ever has a doubt about your ability, because if you're sitting on the tower, you want to know the guys on either side of you are capable and able to back you up. If you get in trouble out there, if you have too many victims, uh, you got to know that they're going to be strong enough and fast enough and confident in the water, and they're going to get there uh, and help you. Because, uh, you know, you could get in trouble uh, out there, have a problem, uh, and that's one of the great things out here is we're always a couple minutes away. We're usually no more than a mile uh, away with the truck. And we're going to have uh, more guys in the back of the truck to back you up and help you out. And then to take care, take over care of that patient, once you get out of the water and you're exhausted, it's not a problem because we're there to back you up. If you are confronted with a couple of troubled swimmers who are in trouble at the same time, mm -hmm. what are the criteria? How do you make a decision? Which one you go for? Is well, uh, you, you go for first? the person who's in the worst shape, you put them on your buoy, and then you go get the next person and then the next. And we've, we've had plenty of times where we had to have multiple victims. Uh, that, that buoy will hold up to six people. Uh, I would hate to have six on my buoy, but it will float them. Uh, and we've had that even, uh, I think, last year in October. Uh, we had a whole, uh, a whole soccer team, I think it was a drill soccer team. Uh, the, the whole team must have got sucked out of this rip current by Joe's. Uh, and we sent a whole bunch of guys, and everybody had multiple victims. Uh, and it was a big, nasty rip. And, and it proved that, yeah, you can float quite a few people. But the, the way we do it, we're going to be sending backup. So we're going to send more, we're going to send paddle boards. Uh, and that, that's one of the things we do more now, is we have paddle boards and uh, other tools that, that uh, not just buoy. Uh, but a lot of times, if it's a distant rescue, if it's far out, we'll send a paddle boarder and get there first and get that person on. Uh, even if it's multiple victims, they can hang on. There's handles all the way around the board, so they can hang on. And then the other guards will be getting there to back them up uh, and to help get them in. Yes, sir. Is there a still a relationship with the Red Chorus, and how has that changed through the years? Well, we, we still, that is a great question. I think a lot of our members even uh, have had to ask that recently. We still are partnered with the Red Cross. Uh, they own the building, uh, and they uh, basically, uh, our training is all Red Cross training, all the certifications that we have. Uh, and the Red Cross, basically they take care of the building, uh, and they back us up uh, with their name and reputation. Uh, 
Um, but the ocean lifeguard training is all our own. It's proprietary. Uh, I wouldn't say we invented it, but we certainly uh, perfected it the way we do here. Uh, and so our lifeguard training is ours. It's not, the Red Cross isn't in the ocean lifeguard business. And that's when it changed, when at the national level, when they realized uh, that they were actually, that we were actually doing ocean lifeguarding, uh, and a, from a risk management standpoint, they said, that sounds really dangerous. Uh, and so uh, they decided that we need to get our own entity, so if we ever got sued, because everybody likes to sue now, uh, if we didn't uh, rescue somebody fast enough or good enough, uh, they'll go ahead and get their lawyer out. Uh, and so the Red Cross, uh, since they are self-insured, uh, they just wanted to be protected. So they're still our partner. We'll still, we're still uh, a part of the Red Cross, but from the sand out, uh, it's all on us. Uh, we're, the, we're now the Volunteer Lifesaving Corps, and there is still the American Red Cross Volunteer Lifesaving Corps, but it's inside this building. Uh, and the, they own the building. They, care for, they, they help uh, repair it if the roof comes off or if we need new or whatever, then they, they help and they pay for that. Yes, ma'am. Can you tell us the history about this building, about how long it's been here? Mm -hmm. This building is the second permanent building uh, that was here. The first building was built in, around 1920, uh, and it lasted up until December of 45. And by that time, that building was in such rough shape uh, that a lot of guys didn't uh, trust to go upstairs. Uh, and it was getting pretty rotten. Jordan? The first, uh, the, definitely the first building itself was no more than a boat shed. Uh, it was one car garage. Yeah. <laughs> that building is on a couple of historical pictures of us, and that was where we started when we started the U.S. Volunteer uh, Life Saving Service, uh, and this was station number one. Because the U.S. had uh, a life saving service that was supported by the, by the federal government, but down here there weren't any life saving stations. Uh, and so we had to start our own. Uh, and after us, and there were several more, uh, but in two years after that, in 1914, we became affiliated with the Red Cross. Uh, uh, Wilbert Longfellow, Commodore Wilbert Longfellow, he was uh, New York Parks uh, director, I think, uh, and he was big on, uh, he had a program called Waterproofing America, and he heard about what was going on down here, he came down and thought it was a great idea, and he convinced the Red Cross to get involved with us, and then quickly the name changed, and you'll see later pictures of that building uh, that became the American Red Cross Volunteer Life Saving Corps in, in 1914. Uh, yes, ma'am. So, where do you get paid from? Uh, the city of Jacksonville Beach. Uh, they realized that we needed lifeguards every day because the Life Saving Corps just did Sundays and holidays, uh, and they realized, well, at some point that, that people are going to swim in the week, too. Uh, so, uh, the natural candidates to hire paid lifeguards were from the Life Saving Corps. Uh, they, they're the rich, we, we started uh, on a volunteer basis and the, the training was uh, second to none. So naturally, uh, ever since then, all the lifeguards uh, at Jacksonville Beach uh, are also Corps members. Uh, they're not required to. By law, it's illegal uh, to require somebody to volunteer, uh, and we don't. Uh, but everybody wants to, uh, they either uh, do, uh, or they, if they decide they don't, they, they're free to resign. Uh, but they do have to get the Life Saving Corps training. Uh, we're not going to hire anybody with lesser skills, and that's our standard and that's our choice to, to require that training. So all of our lifeguards right now uh, have uh, the Life Saving Corps training. So you have a season. We do have a season, and uh, our season basically tapers off. Our biggest season is the 10 weeks that school is out. And right now we're on our seventh week. Uh, we work 10 hour days, uh, and the season tapers down all the way. But I'll, I'll keep lifeguards out uh, as long as it's necessary. I got a, a lot of hours, not a lot, but I've got 34,000 hours that I use as efficiently as I can throughout the year on beach patrol. Uh, the Life Saving Corps doesn't have a labor cost, so we can keep guys out as long as we can get guys out there. And if, so we'll, uh, we'll keep more towers on Sunday and, and more guys down here. Like on Sunday, there'll be 45 guys. On the 4th of July, there might be 50. Uh, where I, can, I have to be able to do it with about 25 uh, Monday through Saturday. Uh, we just can't afford that many people. Uh, it would cost a, a lot, lot more. Uh, so I have 
this much budget, so I use it as much as I can. So in October, I'll have a few, a few guys out here, even in late October, uh, and then we'll start putting guards on the beach as early as uh, March, early March. Uh, I think last year, right in the end of February, I had some guards on the beach. It was nice. Uh, people were swimming, and I had to put some guys on the beach. Uh, so luckily, uh, I have the, the latitude, the, the, uh, the ability to do whatever is necessary to keep the beach safe. Uh, as long as I can keep it within, uh, you know, within the budget. Uh, if it rains, we cut guys and send them home, and I save it up for in October when the weather's nasty and the water's still warm and there's still people in the water. Uh, so, you know, it's always nice to have more, but we try and be efficient with what we got. Uh, and our, our guard sheets are uh, scheduled a little tougher uh, during the week because we're getting paid and we just don't have an unlimited manpower like on on Sundays. We're only limited by the oh, number. Okay. We're only limited by the number we can get to volunteer. Uh, yes, ma'am. Thank you. First of all, I just want to thank you for keeping us safe. It's a big job. Oh, yeah. well, we love it. We love doing it. Uh, it's pretty rare that we get thanks. Uh, it's really rare. Uh, once in a while, somebody will come up and say thanks. Uh, some of the time, you rescue somebody, uh, they're a little embarrassed, uh, or they're, you know, they they say they were going to be okay, or. We try and get there before it gets so bad that it's obvious they need help. But sometimes we do, uh, you know, that person's in no condition to, and we're not looking for thanks. Now the guy's here. Why do we do it, man? Why do we do it? Because we love We all do. We do it because we love it. And if we didn't get thanked one time, uh, it's, it's kind of implied. Uh, everybody that we help, we, we find lost kids. That's one of the busiest things, the, the most frequent cases we have. I don't know how people lose their kids so much, uh, <laughs> but uh, they're fast and they're little, so uh, they're like car keys, they get lost for <laughs> so Car keys can run around, and, and when it's busy, there's a whole bunch of car keys running around, and they all look the same. Over. I have a question. Yes? Um, so it sounds like your training in Jack's Beach is very rigorous and yes. very thorough and comprehensive. What about... We do. Uh, a lot of guards uh, sometimes start out here, uh, and sometimes it's a little too much. Or it's definitely simpler. I, I hesitate to say easier because uh, John Phillips, uh, captain of AB, and Rich Banks, captain of Neptune, we know them well, uh, and they're great lifeguards. They're really good, and but they get they're paid seven days a week. So some of our guards that maybe that leave here for whatever reason, they definitely go to those places, even Hannah Park and Huguenot. Uh, Hannah and Huguenot are run by Fire Rescue, Jacksonville Fire Rescue. Uh, but they're all great guards, um, but they're not they are not like our guards. They're just not. I mean, uh, there's something special here, uh, and it's more than just simple training. Or One of the things we see when we compete is that they're pretty athletic, too, uh, and they do train hard, uh, but we spend more time training them. We spend more time and effort uh, and then ongoing training. Uh, but I, I feel safe uh, letting my family swim at either of those beaches, uh, but not as safe as here. It's just I'm telling you that we got more guards uh, closer together uh, and, and guards that take it seriously. And those guys do. We, we used to uh, have a tradition of kind of making fun of those guys or picking on them, uh, but that's one of the things that I uh, kind of took a role in stamping out that, look, those guys are not amateurs. They're, they're good lifeguards, and don't make fun. Let's, they're our neighbors, and they do the same job that we do. Uh, so one of the things I've tried to do is build a relationship with those agencies. Uh, and then learn, we can learn something from, from any of them. Uh, and a lot of our ex-guards are up there, you know, Garrett Auber uh, and Dave Bue. Uh, you guys know Dave Bue pretty well. Uh, Dave, is, uh, he's got to be 75. Uh, he's still a lieutenant up there. Uh, but yeah, we're proud of them too. Uh, but just the fact that we volunteer and the way we do it, and those guys know about it, even as far away as Virginia, we've been in competitions, uh, and Tom Gill, uh, the captain of Virginia Beach Ocean Rescue, was announcing at the competition, uh, actually at Nationals in Cape May, I think Ben was there, he announced to all the lifeguards that were there from the whole country competing, he's like, if you guys want to know anything about dedication or volunteering, talk to those guys from Jack's Beach and ask them what they do. Like right in front of everybody, in front of like hundreds of lifeguards from California and Hawaii, and I, man, I just, I, I almost had to go sit down. 
It's good that you get the recognition. Yeah. Yeah, it's well, you know, it's, I know that there's some really excellent lifeguards everywhere we go. Like in California, they're pros. The surf is bigger, uh, so we can't kid ourselves uh, and say that it's easier anywhere else. Because uh, being an ocean lifeguard is, is a serious job, and you need to be fit, and you need to be trained. Uh, but we go to those other beaches, like you know, even Hawaii and California, and they're amazing. And you've even gone up against lifeguards from Australia, uh, and they're fast. They're athletes, and they've dedicated that to that profession since they were children. Uh, we've gotten to compete against uh, exchange guards from Australia, from Destin, uh, and I'm sure Destin has benefited a lot from their skills. Uh, they come over from Australia in their summer, they're down there training, and then our summer they come here, and so they train year round. Uh, they're pros. When they re-nourish the beach, mm -hmm. does that sand just replacement or yeah, they, does that make currents that you have to learn? It to does. Uh, not only here, but even like in St. Augustine this year, they're uh, doing replenishment there. When the sand is uh, in a different shape than what the the ocean put uh, in, the, in the shape the ocean made it, uh, it does create rip currents. So we know when they're going to dredge. Like this winter, we're going to dredge again. Luckily, they're doing the winter, luckily for us. One, it won't be in the way uh, for us to do our job, but hopefully through the winter, uh, the spring, uh, winter surf will smooth that out a little bit. But uh, I know from talking to the captain of uh, St. John's Marine Rescue, uh, their calls double. Uh, they, they roughly double when, they've, uh, when they're doing replenishment. And so we expect it, and we tell the guys about it, and the newer guys, of course, haven't been here for it. This last time it happened was during Matthew, uh, and then a little after for the for the June uh, rebuilding. But they're going to be doing that again, and, and we'll be ready. We know every five years or so we do it, uh, and we know how to adjust and handle that and get around it. Uh, but it's definitely a factor. Yes, sir. So uh, last week on the evening news, they were saying that uh, it was becoming harder to find lifeguards, and that older Americans were coming back into service. Are you seeing yep. that as well? Absolutely. Uh, we've had to come up with, uh, you know, more creative ways to recruit. Uh, there's various reasons for that. I think one of the reasons is it, it, it's just not as cool as it was for a, a period there to be like that. Uh, but uh, I don't agree with that. I think it's even cooler. Uh, but it is a nationwide problem, even in pools. Uh, we've read articles from, like, you know, Virginia, where the, they're trying to find pools, uh, pool lifeguards. I had a hotel call me in from Orange Park and asked me if I had any lifeguards that would like to work at their pool. And I told them, look, even if I did, there's no way I'm giving them to you. Uh, unless it's a really, really bad one. Uh, but but we've, uh, we've definitely uh, seen shortages, and so we recruit. We go out there and actively recruit in schools, uh, and we've had to up our game, even on beach patrol. Uh, when I have uh, even quite a few guards on, I have to offer them incentive. Uh, the city's been uh, helpful enough to let us offer them an incentive. If they work 300 hours, uh, they get a little bonus at the end of the season. Uh, and that's helped me get the guards to actually work. Uh, even when we do have 84, sometimes we still struggle to get them to work, even near the end of the, end of the year, when they're getting a little weary and uh, a little sunburned and hot, and, and they're ready to take a break, or they made enough money for the summer, and mommy's going to pay for the rest. But one of the factors we think is uh, young, young uh, people are more successful uh, in school. I, I find a lot more of them going to college. Uh, a lot more of them are having projects and internships, uh, and they have other things that they need to do. Uh, and there's also, uh, you know, there's more money for school. You can get loans, grants, and uh, you can find ways to go to college and not have to bust your butt uh, as much. Uh, but really, it's a combination of factors. And so we've had to go out and, and combat all those. We had to go recruit uh, and find more people. And we're fortunate that we can hire uh, guards as young as 16. Uh, in St. John's County, you got to be 18. Uh, and they're hurting for lifeguards. Uh, Fort Lauderdale, uh, everybody we know definitely uh, has to try and find lifeguards. Now, the bigger places like California, it's very populated, super busy. Uh, and, and they pay them a lot, and, and they have a chance to actually be a full-time lifeguard and even retire. Uh, and in South Florida, it's the same thing. Uh, you can uh, spend a career there, do it for 30 years, and then retire, because they're part of uh, public safety agencies like fire uh, or police, uh, where we're not. Uh, we're part of Parks and Rec, uh, 
Uh, and I'm myself and one of my lieutenants, the only guys that get insurance or benefits or, or sick leave. Everybody else is part time. Uh, and, you know, we certainly would like to get more, but it's just a, it's a cost factor. Uh, and we just have to basically prove that, that it's worth it for uh, the city to keep lifeguards, skilled lifeguards, experienced, well trained, seasoned lifeguards that are EMTs. Uh, and can drive the truck and train all our own lifeguards. So to keep those guys around, we got to keep coming up with other incentives. Yes, sir. Do you think that if you was able to offer room and board to, you know, I mean, we do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we do. I mean, uh, basically, if you're an active lifeguard with the Life Saving Corps, you get the privilege of staying here. You can come up here one night if you want, or if you live far away. I was going to say, yeah. Uh, there are guys that'll. Uh, I had one guy that was lifeguarding this summer. Uh, very uh, seasoned older lifeguard, like you guys said, uh, uh, older lifeguards coming back has definitely supplemented uh, our crew, uh, and they bring that experience. But uh, one of the guys was coming out from Keystone, uh, uh, like a 70 mile drive, and he would spend one, he'd work one day, spend the night, work the second day, and then go home. Uh, so it's definitely here. We definitely have the advantage of we have that camaraderie, we have uh, the social aspect, and at the station. Nobody else has a, a clubhouse or a, we have a fantastic station here. And this building was built from 46 to 48. Uh, and it's still in pretty good shape. It takes constant repair. And we raise a lot of that money ourselves. The Life Saving Corps uh, does fundraisers. Uh, they do fill the buoy. They go out there and, and hold a cutoff buoy. Uh, and people throw coins in there. Uh, we do a golf tournament. We do all sorts of things to keep the organization going because the budget has grown. You guys asked about the uh, partnership with the Red Cross. We now pay for our own insurance. We, we have liability insurance and something like Workman's Comp because we do a dangerous thing, but the Red Cross is like, look, we give up blankets. You know, if your house burns down, we come help you. Uh, if a service member needs to contact your family or get home, they help. They do a wonderful job, but this was just simply too much risk for them to want to uh, absorb. Uh, and for years, they've always been a super great uh, support. All the all the people down at the Chapter House uh, in Northeast Florida Red Cross, they've been huge, and they still are a huge help uh, administratively. Uh, and just the association, just having that name of a, a worldwide recognized uh, organization in, in helping people. Uh, and that's what we do. We help people. We help the community. We help you find, uh, find your kid if they're lost. We pull people out of the ocean. But it's still a great partnership, but we find that we have to raise our own money. Uh, the poor does. Uh, and all the guys pay dues, uh, $50 a year, and they probably get that back in food. Uh, <laughs> well, they definitely do. One of our traditions uh, is deli board. Uh, every Sunday, the guys are volunteering, so the least we can do is have lunch for them. Uh, you guys always had deli board, right? No? Uh, no? Uh, well, Johnny, when was it? When did... When did uh, I don't know when Jelly Board started, because we'd get off the truck, go down to the corner, and try and get a hamburger and get back before the truck left. So we had an hour, and we ended up with 15 minutes. They gave us $2. $2 for lunch. Unless you were on, on uh, Neptune, and then you go to the hotel and eat free. Well, one of, the, one of the things, at some point it changed, the guard money, it all got put into a pot, and then they would go to the grocery store, some grocery store, we try and get a discount. Most places won't, even public still won't give us a deal. Uh, well, but we still, we go to where it's cheapest. Uh, and a lot now, a lot of the alumni, uh, the retired lifeguards, uh, they have a competition now coming to do the best deli board. And usually they get about 200 and some odd dollars uh, to go get whatever food and, and they get lunch cooked hopefully by 11. As the guards rotate off the beach, uh, lunch will be there for three or four hours. Uh, it ends up being about four dollars and a half uh, per person on the guard sheet. So that's a huge incentive. Uh, like Don was saying, we don't want the guys to be gone. We need them here to respond to emergencies. And you only get like an hour off, sometimes two, uh, and then you're back on the beach a few hours. Uh, to maximize that, if lunch is already here, then they can hang out and get come back off the beach, get their lunch, uh, and a lot of times the buzzer will go off. And we'll have to be back on the truck, drop your lunch, and get back out on the beach doing a backup uh, for rescues. But having deli board there is a huge benefit. And for them to give their time still and volunteer in a time when volunteering is not popular, uh, to volunteer 
at least 150 hours a year. Most guys would do three, 400 hours. Uh, I think, I don't know, I've got a few thousand, and all these guys, I'm sure, have several thousand volunteer hours. But to keep people volunteering that much, uh, get them lunch is the least we can do, uh, and making it fun. Uh, the guys will come and do Mexican, and they'll wear a sombrero, uh, or Asian, a, a different theme every time, and they try and make it really interesting. Uh, this weekend, I, I'm not sure what it's going to be, but I know the guy, one of the guys uh, is a firefighter and a retired lifeguard. The other one is a, a ex-Marine scout sniper. Uh, so I can't imagine what he's going to come up with. Uh, but they'll be doing deli board on Sunday. But they do take donations from retired guards. They'll throw another 20 or whatever they can give to kind of supplement it so they can get a little extra extra special food. Uh, and you never can tell what the guys want. When I, when I was doing it, it was cold cuts, uh, sandwiches, some fruit. Uh, but now they try and grill stuff. Uh, they, they do low country boil. They do all sorts of great food for the guys. And, and that really means a lot. And making it fun. Uh, I try and keep the guys uh, disciplined really tight on beach patrol, uh, so they might not think it's as fun to work it for me uh, during the week, but uh, on, the, on Sundays they definitely have a little more fun. There's more guys there, so they can, uh, they can uh, goof around a little and have a little more fun, and, and I don't think anybody minds because they're, they're given so much of their time. Uh, so during the week you don't feed them? Nope. No, during the week uh, they're on their own. We do kind of make the guys... Uh, pool their money. Hey, if you're going to Angie's, uh, you got to tell everybody you're going to Angie's. <laughs> if you sneak off to Angie's, uh, I'm not going to let everybody go at once. I need guys there to respond. So if you go to Angie's and come back with your sub, you're munching on it, and Johnny and everybody else and Ben didn't get any, uh, they're not going to be too happy with it. <laughs> so, but we let everybody know, hey, I'm going to Publix. Anybody want anything? And, you know, I bring my own. A lot of guys will bring. We've got a, a fridge uh, and a grill and a flat cooktop, so we've got a lot of chance to bring food, and I'm real impressed with how healthy the guys eat now. We really, we really had to raise and raise our physical standards, and so continuing to get faster in the water and stronger, uh, we realized we had to eat like an athlete as well as train like an athlete. Uh, when I started, it was just, you had to be tough. You just were tough, and you toughed it out, and soreness wasn't a thing. You know, soreness is you being weak, so you muscle through it, and, and now we realize, uh, that all that, uh, all that training and teaching, we've got uh, a couple people that have degrees in sports physiology. Uh, Caitlin White is one of my star athletes, uh, female athletes, and also about to be a firefighter. Uh, she's got a degree in that. So uh, a lot of our guys have a lot, a lot of experience in how to get stronger and faster and how to eat. Uh, and we all realize that eating a lot more plants and a lot more, you know, it, it never would have been cool to be vegan or vegetarian uh, when I got in. Uh, you would have got laughed at, but now uh, a lot of them realize, you know, they can heal faster, uh, they can run faster, they can they sleep better, uh, and, and do a lot more things if you eat healthy. So, really, really, uh, from the beginning of this, from even when I got here, I was older, I was 24, I, I learned a lot from the day I stepped through the door, uh, and I still learn things. Uh, I still learn things from George, and uh, I just, I, uh, anybody who's a member here, couldn't find a better organization to be a part of. There's people that go on and, and go on into the military, they go into college, and come back. And one good example is, is five of our guys have been Air Force pararescuemen. Uh, anybody know who the, the, the pararescuemen, the PJs are? Nobody at all? Never heard of the pararescue? Air Force pararescue is uh, special forces. Uh, they're paramedics, and they have battle training. Uh, and they, when you're in the Army and the Marines, you get shot up and you're in a bad spot, these guys come in in a helicopter uh, and get you out. They're, para they're, they're battlefield medics, uh, and they have some of the most training of any military group in the world. We've got five of our guys, uh, and now that one passed away in Iraq, four. Uh, but all our guys that have tried out for, for the PJs have made it. Uh, so one of our guys made it to be a master sergeant, team leader, uh, and he died March 15th in Iraq. Uh, all of, us, all of us are better having known him, but, but those guys uh, all said, you know, even uh, Josh Langley, he's still Air Force PJ, uh, I was down there at Patrick Air Force Base, and they were showing us all their cool gear. They've got helicopters and jet skis and boats and parachutes and all this amazing stuff. And I heard him telling somebody, this 
is the best job I ever had. And I, I said, yeah, terrorist. And he said, no, no, no. Lifeguarding in Jack's Beach. <laughs> He's an Air Force commando with guns and all the cool stuff and all the training in the world. And, he, and he's, I've seen pictures of him jumping out of the back of C-130s, uh, jumping on the Keys. He's been in Alaska, all around the world, Afghanistan, Iraq, Africa, and rescue people in every hurricane you've ever heard of from Katrina to Harvey. Uh, those guys are hoisting people off the roofs over there in, in helicopters. Uh, and they're sitting there telling me it's the coolest job they ever had, the best job they ever had, it's right here. And I have SAR guys too. They are. They're well. They're they're definitely more than SAR. They. Yeah, but I mean, do you have SAR guys? Yep. Yeah. One of my uh, year mates, John Rice, uh, is a chief, uh, and he is uh, in the uh, Coast Guard in the West Coast, uh, in the Northwest, uh, and he he hoists into caves. He's my age almost, uh, and he's still uh, a SAR swimmer for the Coast Guard, and uh, and a good one too. And I, I, I see all the stuff that he does. Uh, in a dry suit, in really cold water, in really huge waves, and John will still tell you that he would have never been able to be a SAR swimmer in the Coast Guard if it wasn't for the trainings here. Uh, and it just, every, every guy that you'll talk to will tell you the same thing. Daniel Bulbas, uh, I trained in training committee, and, and he hated me. I, I, uh, I trained him so hard in, in training committee, I, you had to kind of test him, and, and Daniel probably did more push-ups and burpees and running and, and squats and, and just terrible exercise. Uh, We're actually going to put you guys all through this, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like, was all this, uh, I, I was pretty hard on him because I didn't think he was uh, lifeguard material, uh, and he never would quit. And, and then a few years later, uh, Dan was gone. I, I hadn't seen him, and he called down here to look for me. And then he called a second time, and they said, "Hey, Dan Bolas on the phone for you." And I said, "Oh boy, he's." I don't know why he wants to talk to me, <laughs> but but uh, Dan said he said, "Hey Rob, I'm trying to talk to you. I wanted to thank you for being so hard on me because I, I, I I'm finishing up training uh, in the Navy SEAL. You know, I'm, I'm literally about to get in my final phase." Uh, and he said, "I want to thank you." I'm like, "What me? Why me? I was just trying to get you to quit." <laughs> I, I was just trying, literally trying to stand. I was like, I was doing my job. I felt like I had a duty. You'll only accept the, the best lifeguards, and I, I wasn't sure you were it, but you proved me wrong. And wow, I didn't even know that you enlisted. And he said, yeah, I've, I've been in training, and I haven't talked to anybody, and, I, and I'm going to be a Navy SEAL, and I just wanted to thank you. Like, wow. Uh, but but so we all do it. Sorry, I want to just yeah. jump in. It's, it's like clockwork at about an hour. Like, I hear more chairs moving. They start to get a little uncomfortable. Not as uncomfortable as the pews. At the chapter, right? um, so I want to just go back and hit on a topic that we got off topic on, which was mm -hmm. the um, progression of the buildings. So you had the way, way first one mm -hmm. back there, and then the current one, the middle one, technically the second, but you were... This, that building, the I call it the first real building, but it was the first, yeah, the, first the boat shed, you know, the first building was there a few years, but then around 1920, uh, and I know all this mostly because of George's work, because there's pictures throughout the station that I've learned from. In about 1920, they built the second one and tore it down in December of 45. This one was after World War II, so it started. Uh, I read that they didn't quite have enough money as they thought, uh, but they started building this building in 46. You know, we didn't really get to use it until 48. Uh, and for a while, we operated out of a little shed on the boardwalk right out in front. And there's a picture of it in there. But a little shed, they kept all the equipment in. There's no room for any people. But this building uh, reflects the basic layout of the original building, but it's bigger and better and tougher. It survived uh, several, several uh, pretty solid hits from Dora uh, and got a little damage. But and then Matthew, uh, it's just had a lot of wear and tear, but it's been here all this time since you know 46 to 48 till now, uh, and it's been up here. This room was not original. You can tell uh, it's an addition. We just needed more space because we grow in equipment and we grow in, in space that we need. We have a first aid room, we have the dorms upstairs, and we don't want to get rid of any of that. So we needed a classroom to teach all our own because we, we teach more and more to our guys. Everybody recertifies every year and then we teach to the, occasionally to the public. And we have a junior guard program with 47 kids. Uh, any kids from 9 to the age of 15 come through the junior guard program. 
uh, and we get a lot of great lifeguards out of that program. We'll find kids that get inspired to do what we do. They see us while they're doing their, their uh, camp. It's kind of like a camp, but they get all the real training. Uh, they swim at Coach Paw. Uh, administers that, and he started lifeguarding in 64. And uh, Coach is 75, and he goes in the water every day, uh, unless it's so flat that it's not worth it, but he goes surfing. Uh, and he, he's been a coach, uh, gosh, what is he coached? Uh, John, John Carraway is also a swim coach. He, he's, he's coached every sport you can think of, except maybe golf. Uh, but he, he was a teacher at Fletcher for 30, 40 years. He retired as a teacher and came back. He's doing a great job with his kids. He's doing a great job. He's tough, and I still think not too many of our guards would cross him. Uh, even though he's 75, I think they would be afraid for him to get a hold of him. Uh, <laughs> if he needs to do some damage, he could. But, uh, yeah, it's a really this building is really an amazing thing. It's more than just a lifeguard shack. Uh, this is a symbol to all our guys. This is like a second home, or like I said, a primary home sometimes. It's a place to come back to if you need to get away. Uh, a lot of the young guys can't wait till they turn 18 so they can move in uh, to get out of maybe out of mom and dad's house or rules. But, but we have very strict rules. Uh, one of the things that allows it to go on like this is the strict rule. There's no alcohol, no guests. Uh, you can give a tour, but you can't have any guests. You can't have uh, uh, no shenanigans, no, no smoking, no alcohol. It's very strict uh, because... We have this concept of uh, public image, uh, or we call it public discredit. Uh, public discredit will get you kicked out of the core. Uh, even you guys have probably seen guys get kicked out, and they probably deserved it. Uh, maybe sometimes they didn't, but we're very strict on your image. If, if, if you do something bad enough that makes us look like bad guys, uh, you're going to go, you're going to leave. Uh, they, the, the staff does a very good job at administering the rules. And, and the guys all know, uh, the guys are all uh, trained in the rules and what, what they're expected to do. But it's very important for us to keep up uh, the good character. On the back of every annual, every yearbook every year, there's a picture. In the caption, every year, it says the same thing. Men of good character. Uh, and now it says uh, men and women of good character. But that's one of the things we require of them is good character. They don't have to be the fastest runner or the fastest swimmer. They don't have to be the smartest. Uh, but they got to be dedicated, and they got to be men of good character. Uh, and we teach it. Uh, we mentor. We even had a, a formal class, a leadership class. Uh, and I had leadership training in the military, and I put that up against uh, the best that the U.S. Navy had uh, in their training. We definitely. Uh, I was a Navy rescue swimmer uh, in my time that I was in, uh, and I can tell anybody absolutely for sure my training that I got in 1994 was just as hard uh, as having grown uh, adult male rescue swimmer instructors drown me in the pool. It was just as bad and just as hard to become a lifeguard here. Uh, and they both were very hard. But I think if I hadn't been a Navy rescue swimmer before that, I would have never made it in here. Uh, I was determined, but uh, I wouldn't have made it without my classmates. Even in their recruit class, in the training class, 12 weeks, uh, you get taught the camaraderie and the teamwork right away. Uh, you get taught that without your class, without all your classmates helping each other out and working together, studying together, we impress that in them right at the beginning, that you're not any good alone. You're not going to go out in the water alone. You're not going to go on a rescue alone. Uh, and you're not going to be in this organization alone. You're going to have about 100 brothers, 100 sisters. You're going to have, uh, it's going to be a family uh, that you always uh, didn't know you wanted to have <laughs> What a nice note to end. Yeah. <laughs>
firsthand from people who've been there. But um, I know there were still a few questions out there, and I think Rob will probably be here forever. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> Indefinitely. Is. So please feel free to ask him. Um, and one of the things we wanted to do while you were here, if you're interested, uh, we since we're here, like I said, this um, lifeguard station has just been part of the skyline of Jacksonville Beach since the 40s. Sarah's brought some pictures yeah. of what the um, boardwalk looked like kind of in relation to where we are right now. So if you want to walk out onto the boardwalk and she can show you those pictures. Anybody here remember the boardwalk days? Okay, so ask them because they'll know better than young Sarah here exactly what things look like. But if you want to walk out that way, you can. Please feel free to hang out here, grab a cookie, um, whatever you want to do. Not whatever you want to do, you know, there's rules here. But um, please feel free to stop and ask um, George and Rob and the other um, veteran guards any questions you have. And anybody who wants to check out the boardwalk, just follow Sarah. If, if you guys ever want in the future, please come by and take a tour. Uh, Any time at all when we're here, because we're we're a lot less private than we used to be. Used to be nobody would get a tour unless you were a very pretty girl. Uh, but now uh, now we're really proud of it. We realize that we got to market ourselves, and show everybody what we got, and what we do. And please fill out your 